Somebody say, praise the Lord. Amen. Wow, there are so many mothers here in S-A-L. S-L-A, S-A-L, S-L-A. Amen, Serban Life Assembly. And a blessed, happy Mother's Day to each and every one of you again. It's a very joyous day, a day that we not just remember, not just celebrate, what we, but we really honor even all the mothers here. When I received an invitation from Tandi Ling on behalf of the church to come and share here, you know, and uh, the, the days did not fit out well, work out well, and then, and then she invited me to preach on Mother's Day. I said, are you sure you want to share on Mother's Day? And uh, I think customarily, you will find that uh, usually it's a lady pre uh, preacher or pastor. A lady who will come and share on Mother's Day and a man will share on Father's Day. But I tell you, SLA is a church that dares to step outside of the balls. <laughs> and have the reverse, have a man to preach and share on Mother's Day. I salute you and I took up the challenge to be here with you all today. It's a very unique situation, but uh, I believe that God has something for each and every one of us. Now, some people may say that Mother's Day is not for everybody. You know, maybe because there are people who have desired for children but could not have. There are people who have lost their moms or their children. And uh, there are uh, various kinds of situation. But as, as, as has been brought out right from the beginning, there's nobody here, nobody here who does not have a mother. Who did not, have a, uh, uh, who did not originate from even the womb of a mother. So all of us, there is something for each and every one of us. But today, and, and, and Lily at the same time, you know, said, uh, 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 shared with me and said that, yeah, you know, uh, Sremban Live, where we do celebrate, you know, uh, Mother's Day, but you can share on anything. <laughs> I like that kind of liberty. You can share on anything. Now, today I'd like to share more on, on, on mothers or for mothers and also for children. Many times Mother's Day, we hear, we hear a message only directed towards the mother, but today I'd like to direct towards the children, all right? Because it's not just all about mothers, but also children, and not only that, but also the family. And so, you, you know, there is something for each and every one of us. This is my first time here, and what an honor, what a privilege, and I want to thank you once again to the leadership here for their kind invitation for me to be here with you all. It's great to be here. Come on. Hallelujah. It's great to see each and every one of you and some old friends as well. <clears throat> you know, a mother was sharing with an old friend of hers and said, you know, giving birth is the easiest thing. But the most difficult thing is you have to show up for the job 24-7. That's the most difficult thing. You have to show up for the job 24-7. Now we know that to be a mother is not easy. And to all the mothers here, thank you for showing up. Amen. Thank you for showing up. And I do not mean just for the church service, but in the lives of your family, you show up at every single moment. And that's the toughest job, even whether you like it or not, uh, rain or shine, whether you are well or sick, you, are, you still show up for the job as a mother, and we salute you for that. Another mother says, you know, before I got married, I got three theories of raising children. After I got married, I got three children, but no theory. <laughs> now, it's not easy at all. It's not easy. We know that, you know. But mothers play a very influential role. Influential role. And you find that in the Bible, the word mother appears 321 times. In 293 verses of the Bible, it shows that mothers' role in the Bible are very important. And many of the examples of mothers in the Bible are mothers who are so heroic in their feats and in what they do. 
They are not just ordinary people whose place is confined to the kitchen or to certain specific roles and responsibilities as determined, as decided by society. So mothers are very heroic in the Bible. You'll find that. France has 69 kings and emperors. But there were only three kings that were really, really liked by the subjects. And those three kings that were liked by the subjects were those three kings that were raised by mothers. Not by tutors, not by guardians, but mothers. That's how influential you are in determining the direction of your children. And not only that, but even of nations. That's why Napoleon himself was the one who made the remark and said, the hands that rock the cradle is the hands that rule the world. Wow! Hallelujah! So mothers, your hands are powerful hands and they can accomplish even great things. And so you'll find that today we want to honor even mothers. Now this is one of the, not, 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 not hardest, but it took me about two years to prepare this message. What do you mean two years? <laughs> Li Ling invited me not, I mean, some time ago, but not, definitely not two years ago. Because one day I was reading a passage of scripture. When I read the scripture, man, it gripped my heart. I say, this will, this will be a powerful word for, 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 for family, for parents, for mothers. And so I noted, I noted the passage. When I read across something, when God speaks to me, I noted and, and I filed it away. You know, and I never came back to read until when I got this invitation to come and share here on Mother's Day. Then I searched for the file. Where, where, what, what passage is that? I can't remember, you know. I searched for it and then I found it and only about three, a few weeks ago, began serious preparation on this message. So in that sense, it took two years ago, this word or the passage of scripture was dropped into my heart. And there is none other than from John chapter 19, verse 25, to verse 27. John chapter 19, verse 25 to 27. And that is where Jesus said, Behold, Mother. Let's read together even this passage of Scripture. Just a few verses. Shall we read together? Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. Shall we read together? When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Now we know this passage of scripture. It's a very, very significant, very, very important, if not the most important part of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ when he was there, hanging on the cross. The cruelest moment in history reveals the tenderest part in the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. The darkest moment in history reveals the brightest hope even for the family. So there Jesus was hanging on the cross, crucified. And there we have what we call the seven last sayings of Jesus Christ. All right, you can go back and check it. The seven last words of Jesus Christ. And then here we have the third saying of Jesus. The third saying of Jesus, and these are the words of Jesus hanging on the cross. Let's look into details. What, what, what actually happened here? Sometimes we read the scripture so fast, you know, and it's just a story. But begin to meditate. Begin to understand what the, the gravity of what is really happening here. And there is a message for each and every one of us. Behold, first of all here, a mother's love. There she stands. 
Verse 25, now that stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. Now the Bible tells us here that when Jesus was crucified on the cross, all the disciples left him. And most of the people left him except for a few close ones. The Bible tells us there were four women that were there. Four women. But before that, the Bible also tells us there were four soldiers. Four soldiers at the cross. And what were they doing? They were feeding their ego and their selfish desire, greedy appetites. A man, the son of God, was dying on the cross. And all they could do is fight for what is left of, his, of, of, of him. The tunic, the turban, the girdle, and the inner garment as well. For that, they cast a lot. A man is dying and all they could think of are the physical things. Not knowing that the one hanging on the cross offers them the riches of the kingdom of God. Four soldiers on one side, four women on the other side. And these four women, they were not wanting to get anything at all. They were there to offer something. They were there to share in something. They were there out of love, out of concern, out of brokenness they came. So unlike the four soldiers, they came without any selfish interest at all. But just to pour that love and affection to the one who means so dear to them. So of these four, they are Mary, the mother of Jesus. Then another uh, 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 Mary Magdalene. Then there is Mar Mary, the wife of Cleopas. And there is another person, the, uh, the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and who is most likely Salome, who is the mother of James and John. Four women were there. And besides that, there was John. John, the beloved disciple. What happened to the rest? Nobody else were there. What happened to the rest of the disciples? They have all tabooed or run away already. Except these four women and a man. And among these, of course, there stood the four women and John. And one of these women is Mary. They stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. They stood. You know what? Mom is always there, isn't it? Mom is always there. Somebody says that mothers have an amazing ability to be everywhere at the same time. Amazing ability. And they're able to multitask, they're able to do so many things. The word stood there is not just like what we commonly understand. Just stand there. La. As a stand by, uh, 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 as a watcher, observing what is happening. Just standing there, doing nothing. No, no, no. In the, in the Greek, the word uh, uh, stood, that is from Hishnamai. That means you stand there, not as an observer, but as a participant. You are there, or, or rather they, they were there. Not just to watch what is happening, but to participate what is happening. They were there, not just to witness the pain of Jesus, but they really felt the pain themselves. They were there, not just to see a man tortured on the cross, but their souls were themselves tortured. They were there, not just to see a man dying, but there was something that was dying inside them as well. They stood there as a participant. They felt the pain, the agony. It wasn't just a casual by. Standard. Standing there just curious of what is happening. But they felt it. Yes, they felt it to the innermost part of their being. Why? Because it's the mother's heart. It's the mother's heart. 
on the cross of Jesus Christ, they kneel. The word that says, this is Jesus of Nazareth. But for Mary, this is not Jesus of Nazareth. This is my son. This is my son. Mary fell in. She stood there. Mom is always there. Mom is always there. And it was so exemplified in the life of Mary as she saw her son brutally crucified in that manner. She was there because of love. Jesus was up there because of love. Oh, the mother's love. I think it was well portrayed already, even in the poem that the little boy read just now. Or say, the mother's love. It's always there. A mother's love never dies. When the son becomes the prime minister, mother loves him. When the daughter becomes CEO of a multinational company, mother loves him. Her. When the son became a dropout from school, secondary school, mother loves him. When the son got into drug addiction, John Gangsterism, was in prison, mother loves him. When the daughter got into vices and became a prostitute, sold herself for money. To survive, mother loves her. A mother's love is never dying. She may not approve of the circumstances. She may not approve of what the children does or do. But her love is always there. Mothers, can you say amen to that? Hallelujah. Yes, her mother's love is undying. That's why when God created man, man first, and then woman, he created them what? In the image of God. Both of them have the image of God. But woman who came later was given that kind, I don't know what happened there, but God gave that kind of extraordinary grace when when, when, when he created a woman out of man, so that there is the capacity to love as a mother. There is the capacity, something that is not found in man. God has, maybe, all right, in version two, man is version one, woman is version two. God put an extra, extra, <laughs> Cheap inside there. That makes them so special with the capacity to be a mother. So much so that God likens himself to a mother. In Isaiah chapter 66, verse 12, I think, the Bible says, as a mother comforts her children, so will I comfort you, O Israel, and you will be comforted. God likens himself and his love and his comfort to that of a mother. Hey, mothers, that's the greatest compliment that God gave to mothers. Do you know that? When God is able to liken himself to that of a mother, the comfort, the love of a mother, that is extraordinary. His mother was there. Looking upon the son who was hanging there, oh, how she loves him. When everybody else had forsaken, Jesus Christ, the mother, was there. Thank God for mother. 
thank God for mother. Your mother's love. Independent of any circumstances, whether tragedy, difficult times, hard times, the mother's love, it is extraordinary. It is divine. Now, not everyone manifests that love in the same way, in the same proportion. And that's why you find that, hey, what I'm talking about, about mothers, some foreign to some of you because you say, that's not my mother. I do not experience that kind of thing from my mother. You know? But nevertheless, whatever it is, that that expression may be outstanding or it may be, 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 be kept inside or it may have been flawed, whatever it is, God has made mothers with that extraordinary divine capacity even to love and to comfort. Thank God for mothers who is always there. You know what? A mother is a doctor when the child is sick. A mother is a banker when the child is broke. A mother is a teacher when the child needs to learn something. A mother is a lawyer when the child needs somebody to stand by him, fight for him. A mother... She's always there. She's the police officer when the child needs to be stopped. <laughs> Hallelujah. Her mother is everything because she is always there. Thank God. She's the last to go to bed and the first to rise up. Yeah. Come on, give a hand to mothers. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But I say, it's not only about the mothers. It's about the sun as well. And these are very important. Very, very important. And so the Bible here tells us in the next verse, in verse 26, when Jesus saw his mother there, Jesus saw. The word see is not just the visible sight. But it is a perception. The perception of a mother and the knowledge of the mother. It is not just visible. It is mental. It is emotive. It is everything. Mom, I see you. This is a very powerful word. Just like the word standing and now we have another word see. Jesus saw right into the innermost being of the mother. Not just a distraught mother standing there, but Jesus really saw something there. Mom, I see you. But many children, they don't see in the same way. They don't see what Jesus saw. When Jesus saw the mother, she saw, yes, somebody who have gone through much sacrifice for the Lord Jesus Christ, right from the time of the birth, the mother had to travel all the way from Nazareth to Bethlehem, where Jesus Christ would be born, when she was pregnant, so close to the time when the pregnancy is due, she had to endure that journey. The mother sacrificed when they have to flee to Egypt. Cannot live an ordinary life. The mother sacrificed when everybody accused her of adultery. That Jesus is born without a father. She is born outside, outside of marriage and, and, and Mary is an adulterer. Committed fornication. She had to endure all the shame. Jesus sees and knows all of that, what the mother has to go through for him. That's why the first miracle of Jesus Christ, the turning of the water into wine, the mother was very fast and said, come on, Jesus, do that miracle. Show to them that you are the Messiah. She has endured too much already. Jesus sees the sacrifice of the mother. 
And now in his final moment, he saw the mother there sacrificing. It is dangerous. It is risky just to be near the cross of Jesus Christ. Peter at the courtyard already denied Jesus. Don't want to have anything to do with Jesus. Don't want to be associated with him. But here was the mother standing by the cross. She could have been arrested and she could have been killed as well. Anybody who is associated with Jesus. That's why none of the disciples were there. It was risky business. But do you know that from the time that a baby is born, her baby is born, the mother has taken the risk and put her life on the line. Anything can happen. We have heard of many cases where mothers died because of the birth of, a, of the child. That's what happened to my mother. Not after giving birth to me, but after giving birth to my sister, my younger sister. We have eight in the family. And after giving birth to her, the, now I don't know the whole full story, but from what I gather from my father, my mother died. A woman who is willing to sacrifice. And Jesus sees all the sacrifice. Jesus not only sees the sacrifice, but he felt the pain. He felt the pain. I see you, mom. In distress, in agony, in pain. Children do. Have we ever seen the distress and the pain and agony of our mother? Or do we take them for granted? They are like robots in the, in the house, able to do everything. So we just drop everything and mother will pick up. Hey, but what they have to go through. How many of us see our mother as she really is? Yeah. Many of us think, mom, my mom is a super mom. She can do everything. Hallelujah. But do you see her struggle? Struggle to even raise the family. In an ordinary home. And how much more if, if mothers are single parents, if they are widows, it's even more challenging. Jesus sees the pain. Jesus sees the weaknesses. There were times when the family failed him. In fact, most of the family members, the brothers and the, uh, the siblings especially, they did not believe in Jesus Christ until after the resurrection. And the mother of Jesus, yes, yeah, she knows the destiny of, 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 of Jesus already. But she would find out that this son here is more determined to do the will of the father than to fulfill the dream of the mother. Jesus says, I, don't you know that I must be about my father's business? And now this is the last business that he's doing for the father. But the mother's dream, what happened to the mother's dream for the son? Yes, the pain. Jesus saw the pain, the agony, the struggle of his dear mother. That's why T.L. Nord says, We are imperfect beings, raising imperfect people in an imperfect world and that is perfectly okay hey mothers in spite of the fact that they are full of love compassion and they will defend the family just like a lion over the cubs yet they are filled with witnesses and their own struggles their own pain and agony and that's the kind of world that we live in. But Jesus saw, I like that word, Jesus saw his mother. How do you see your mother? Children, how do you see your mother? Some people say, oh, my mother is a burden to me. Especially when they are older. 
for Jesus hanging on the cross. He did not see his own pain. He did not feel his own pain. But he saw and felt the pain of the mother. Mothers are never a burden. They are a blessing. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. And so Jesus, now, now when you are in pain, what happens? You know, if any part of your body is, is in pain, you find that your concentration on other things just falter and you can only concentrate on your pain. You don't care about other things already, you know, late pain, this pain, that pain. Oh, you forget about all other people and you are only thinking about yourself. Pain is so uh, 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 self, you know, uh, cause you to turn inwards towards your pain. But there was Jesus. The pain of, the, of, 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 of on, on the forehead, the pain on the hand and the nails on the, on the feet. He was in excruciating pain, the most painful death. And yet, in his final moments, he was thinking of others. The first saying, we, we talk about the seventh saying, the first saying of Jesus Christ is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He's thinking about them. Those who are lost, who don't know what they are doing, and put him on the cross. The se second saying of Jesus Christ is, Today you shall be with me in paradise. He's thinking about the criminal. He's not thinking about himself. And now the third saying, he looked at the mother and he would say, Behold. He's not thinking about himself. Still thinking about others. And he was thinking of his mother. Have a kind thoughts for mothers. Have a kind perception of mothers. No matter how they may have feel us. Some may have even abandoned out of desperation or circumstances their children. No matter what has happened. See your mother through the eyes of Jesus. The perception. And when Jesus saw, the Bible says, he saw his mother there. Not only did he saw the sacrifice, not even though he saw the pain, but he saw he was looking into her future as well. Hey, she needs help. Mom needs help. For her future. Mom needs provision. Who's going to take care of mom? He's thinking of her future. He saw her future. And he will not leave her helpless at all. He will do something about it before he died. Mama has needs as well. Mom is in pain, yes. And Jesus couldn't help that part. But at least he can provide for her. He can make provision for her. Some of the pains of moms you can never get inside. But at least you can make some provision even for moms. The Bible says in Proverbs 23 verse 22, Do not forget your father who gave you life. And your mother, do not despise your mother when she grows old. Do not despise, but love them. Love, care, provide for them. I mean, you know, if you were to ask your mom today, Mom, what do you need? I want to get a gift for you for, or for Mother's Day. If you were to ask her last week or even yesterday, you know what mom will say? Huh? No need lah. <laughs> exactly. No need lah. Nothing lah. You know. You know. And all those things. Mom, mom is, is somebody who seems to be like somebody who doesn't need anything. <laughs> Only a sensitive child will look into her heart and be sensitive to her needs. And Jesus teaches that. So children, 
see it among. Not just physically, but with perception, knowledge, understanding, and love. Sorry about that. But it says, behold your mother. Behold your mother. And Jesus said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he turned to the disciple, his disciple, who is John, the beloved disciple. And he said, behold your mother. This is a third saying of Jesus, as we say. Behold your son. Behold your mother. Wow. Words are powerful. Words are very powerful. Now when we hear Jesus addressing the mother as woman, we thought, oh, yo, this is very uncouth. Huh? You call your mother woman, uh, you know? Hey, but in Aramaic, the term woman is a term of affection. It's not crass, it's not crude, it's not disloyalty. But the word woman is a very positive term, a term of endearment, if you please. And affection. And so when Jesus says woman, you find that it's nothing extraordinary. In the miracle of turning water into wine, he also used the same word, woman. Behold your son. Behold your mother. Those were the words from his mouth. Powerful words. It is like his last will and testament. Jesus got no property to give. Jesus got nothing to give to the mother. But yet, there on the cross, he says, Woman, behold your son. Behold, to the disciple, he said, Behold your, your mother. These are like his last will and testament spoken out. And it is as binding as a written will. When you write your will, it's time, it's job, it's legalized, it's valid. Jesus did not have that signed document. But his parting words, his last will and testament is these words. And the words that are used is very binding. It's not just a piece of advice. Here you are, son. Here you are, mom. No. It is like a betrothal, you know, an engagement. Or a marriage. When the minister would ask, would you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? And you say, I do. And the man says, and, 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 and the woman, uh, 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 and, and likewise to the, uh, to, the, to the other party, would you take you know, this uh, a woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? You say, I do. Then it's binding. And so Jesus is binding the two parties together. In a very, very divine arrangement. And what he's doing is, he's caring. The care and provision that he provided for the mother. As we have said, he has nothing to give to the mother. No property to leave behind. But he gave his mother a son. A son who will take care of her for the rest of her life. Isn't that wonderful? That's the greatest thing that Jesus could have done. All the care and provision that Jesus did for the mother. It is just like David in 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 3. David was running away even from Absalom, his son, and he was hiding from place to place and all that. And then they, they reached a place called Mizpah in Moab. And he told the king of Mizpah, can you please take care of my mom and dad while I seek God and see what his will for me is? Even while wandering in the wilderness, 
David made sure that his mother and father, they are safe. He entrusted them to the king of Mithpah. And it's the same way that Jesus cared. Can you just imagine the most monumental work on earth is being done? The salvation of the entire universe is being worked out while Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross. And at the same time, Jesus looked at the mother and cared for the mother and worked out the earthly arrangement for her mother. It's not just for the entire world, but for one dear woman who is her mother, his mother. He will take care of her by entrusting him to the care of John. Now, there are those of us who say, oh, I'm doing the work of God. The work of God must come first. You see, Working for God and duties in the family, they do not conflict. As far as Jesus is concerned, they do not conflict. You talk about family. Some people say they serve God and they give God 24 hours of their life every day until the families are neglected, until the father and the mothers are neglected. Jesus never did that. On the greatest work to be accomplished on earth, at that moment, he made sure that the, mothers are taken, that the mother is taken care of. Wow. So serving God is not an excuse for not taking care of our family. Family matters, amen? amen. Family matters, family counts. Now I know that we face many challenges in our society. Some of us are just struggling to make ends meet and we have our own children to take care and this and that. I understand all of that. We know that we all go through that and sometimes it's just so difficult. We, we, I, know, I, I, I went through that myself as well with regard to my father. But you find that, hey, through all of these, let us never forget to make provision as far as it lies within us, to make provision even for our family. When I came back, I was here. My father is in Alastar. I gave her, I, 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 I gave her, uh, I got her, I got him a supplementary uh, uh, credit card. I say, just charge, just use anything, any amount that you want to use, just charge it to my card, you know, uh, because we are, we are far away. Guess what? He never charged anything, maybe because he doesn't know how to use a credit card. <laughs> we try to provide. Put them first rather than just ourselves. So Jesus took care of all family matters. And not only that, brothers and sisters, there is a relationship that is formed. Very important. When he says, here's your son, here's your mother. Very powerful words. Maybe that's another reason why Jesus called at this time the mother woman. Because from now on, I'm not going to be your son. You are going to have another son. His name is John. I'm going away. And to call her, to call her mother at the time will be heartbreaking. You call me mother and then you leave. You know? Herodotus says, the historian, Herodotus, the historian says, in peacetime, it is children who bury the parents. But in war times, it is heartbreaking for parents to bury their children. I repeat, in peace times, it is children who bury their parents. But in war times, it is, it is parents who bury their children. Now, I mean, not necessarily war times, it can be any times. And it's always painful for parents to bury their children. Painful. I've seen so many cases as a pastor when the children go before the parents. It's difficult for the parents. They need the grace of God. That's why Jesus made arrangement. No, no. Jesus had other brothers and sisters who were alive then. How come Jesus never asked any of them to take care of the parents? 
to take care of the mother. In fact, Jesus had four half-brothers. Do you know that? The Bible tells us Jesus had other four half-brothers whose names are James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. All the names are given for us. And he also has other sisters. And yet, they are all alive. And if the firstborn Jesus is gone, then it is upon the shoulders of the next one, of uh, uh, the, the son or daughter, to take care of the mother. And yet Jesus never asked any of them. He said, he pointed to John. Why? In the first place, none of the children showed up. None of his brothers or sisters showed up. Bible tells, tells us they did not believe in Jesus. John chapter 7, verse 5. None of the brothers believed in Jesus at that point. It was only after the resurrection of Jesus Christ they believed in Jesus. And here we have Jesus turning to John and says, this is your mother. Maybe because John is the cousin of Jesus, but more so it's because they believe in him. They believe in his mission. They believe these two, you know, Mary and John, they believe in, in him being the son of God. They were one, a king with him. That's why Jesus put them together. Jesus knows who can handle the mother and best. And that's John. Brothers and sisters, we have simple responsibilities that is to care, even for our family, even for our loved ones. And by putting John and Mary together, you know what? There is a power of connection. There is a power of connecting. When Jesus is about to be taken of the, key, of, of the scene, he put the two together and it works out very, very well. Brothers and sisters, when something is taken from your life, don't think that it's the end of everything. Don't think that it's the end of everything. Mary could have felt, oh, it's the end of my world. But no. To Mary, Jesus says, here's your son. There is a power of connection. When you lose a child, God may connect you to another child. When you lose a husband, God may connect you to another man. When you lose a wife, God may connect you to another woman. When you lose a house, God may connect you to another house. When you lose a job, God may connect you to another job. When you lose something, it's not the end of everything. Do I hear an amen on that? Some people think that my end, my life has ended. It's too rough. It's too tough. No. It's never the end when God is there. God will provide. I have a story to tell. And I say, God will provide. Somebody say, amen. amen. God will provide no matter what you have gone through. Yes, I hear the lightning striking. Yes, I hear the thunders rolling. But I'm here to tell you, God will provide. Hallelujah. And in this connection, he provided for Mary. He provided for John. Hallelujah. God will do it for you, no matter what you have gone through. There is always hope, and there is always life in him. Finally, the Bible here tells us, and from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. That very moment. John did not say, oh, I don't think I can do it. Oh, I don't think I have the resources. Oh, I'll be too busy serving you, oh Lord Jesus. No, no. Nothing of that. Immediately, without hesitation, the Bible says he took her home. Now, the word home is not in the original text. If you read in, the, in your Bible, you'll find that it's in italics. Whenever anything is in italics in your Bible, that means it's not in the original text in Greek, but it's inserted to make sense of the sentence. All right, so that we understand how he took her home. But in original text, it's not just a home. It's not just a house. The Bible in, in the original just says, he took her, that's all. He took her. He just took her. Not just to a physical house, 
but he took her as part of his life. As part of his life. And it is very powerful. He, he did not say, oh, you are, you are not really my mother, but I will accept you anyway. No, he be, she became part of his life. She became even a dearer, perhaps even, than, than, than his own mom. Part of his life. But the home is what we all want, isn't it? You will not be lonely. Uh, in that kind of a home that God wants to establish. And to give you a new start even. It's not just a house, you know it. Some of us can live in very expensive houses, bungalows, penthouse and all that. And yet we feel so lonely. We feel so isolated. Left behind. This neglected by others. But the Bible here says home. Home is where the heart is. Home is what God wants to give to each and every one of us. When He connects us in the family of God. He connects us in the family of God. A godly home and family. And the final time that we hear about Mary is found in Acts chapter 1, verse 14. And it is very interesting to see not only where she is and what she is doing, but also who was there with her. And the Bible tells us that she was in the Upper room, Mary, this Mary there standing on the cross, so broken, is now in the upper room with the rest of the disciples, with the 120 waiting there in the upper room. And what was she doing? She was praying. Mary is always that prayerful person. She was praying and praying. She was with the rest of the group. And not only was she praying, and what, who was with her? The Bible tells us very, very clearly in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, with his brothers. The brothers of Jesus were now in the upper room. Previously, even up to the point of his crucifixion, they were not there. They were not believers, but now in the upper room, they already had become believers. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they believed their own brother is the Messiah indeed. And they were with Mary now in the upper room. Oh, what a blessed sight. What's the desire? If you are a Christian here, a Christian mother, what's your greatest desire? What's your greatest desire for your children? If you were in the family like Mary, whose own children, through Joseph, did not believe in, 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 in Jesus What's your greatest desire? I think for us Christian parents here, you know, our desire is that our children will follow the Lord, isn't it? That's the greatest desire. That's our heart's desire that your children will grow up, you know, and under your influence and prayer that they will follow the Lord. And that's what happened now in Acts chapter 1 verse 14. Mary had that fulfillment of her dream. All her children now were together with her, praying, waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. In other words, her children has now become God's children. And it says, that's the greatest joy for a mother. A prayer has been answered. The children are now saved and in the kingdom of God. And not only are they saved, but one of them, James chapter 1, the one who wrote James chapter 1, verse 27, one of them, James, his, her son became the, a leader, a church leader in the church of Jerusalem. So much so that in James chapter 1 verse 27, which was, which was, which, which was written by James, the son of uh, Mary, one of the sons of Mary, uh, uh, James him, himself says, what is, the, what, what, what is the spiritual thing to do? What, what, what is true religion? True religion is that you do not neglect widows. And orphans. Widows. He knows what he's talking about. His own mother is a widow. Do not forget your widows and the orphans. And he wrote such a powerful treatise there. Brothers and sisters, oh, what a solemn privilege it is for us to be part of the family of God, to have a home. One of the key themes here is a strong family. Here we are. All right, God has connected all of us together. 
And Jesus, as one time he, he pointed to the, to, the, this, uh, uh, to the crowd, he says, here are my brothers, here are my sisters, and we are the family of God. Amen? Amen. Your neighbor, left, right, front, back, this is your family that God has put together. This is the home, the Christian home that God has put us together. Hallelujah. No matter what happens outside, God has put us all together just as in the upper room. And now God is filling us with His Holy Spirit. Can you imagine the brothers of Jesus going out to preach the gospel? Hallelujah. And we have been sent out by the power of the Holy Spirit even to tell the good news of Jesus Christ. And so brothers and sisters, behold, Behold what God is doing here in the mothers, in the sons, in the family, in the church. He's doing a wonderful work. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let us all pray together now. Wonderful Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, dear Lord. Thank you, dear Lord. Hallelujah. We praise you. We praise you. We praise you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you, dear Lord. Oh, God, you love us so much, Lord. Jesus, on the cross, you are still thinking about us. You are still thinking about the mothers. You are still thinking about the sons. You are still thinking about the lonely, dear Lord. You are thinking about the family. And, Lord, you have done everything well. You have put everything together. Today, we praise you. We give you the glory. Hallelujah. I know we have prayed for the mothers, but let me pray for each and every one of you here this morning whether you are a mother or whether you are a son or a daughter or a grandson or a granddaughter whoever you are if the Lord is speaking to you today certain words concerning mother mothers or children parents whatever it is or the family of God here and it hasn't been easy for you at all you have felt the pain, the struggle, and you wonder, can you ever make it? It's been tough. It's been tough. And some of you have lost your loved ones even, and you thought that's the end of it already. Life is not going any easier for you. But today, through the word of the Lord, God is causing you to arise. Arise to your privilege. Arise to your responsibilities. Arise to the new life that God wants to inject into you. No matter what you have lost, no matter what you're going through. Receive the word of the Lord. In just this brief encounter at the cross, at the foot of the cross, so many things happen. But the one that shows the tenderest moment of Jesus Christ is when he said, Behold your son. Behold your mother. Arise and receive strength, power, love, forgiveness. Some of all of us need that. Somebody says, When a, when a person sees the weaknesses and the imperfections of the mother, he has grown into adolescence. But when a person learns to forgive his mother, he has grown into adulthood. But when, when the person learns to forgive himself, he has grown wise. Wherever we are today, God is teaching us new things. His love above all, His power, His promise. Shall we all stand together in the presence of the Lord? I'd like to pray for any one of you who 
whom the Lord is speaking to right now, and you just want to come to the altar, whether you're a mother or a child or, 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 